Okay, so here we are for the first keynote of uh, this year's Gwadek, um, Matthias Kirchner, uh, who is the Vice President of the Free Software Foundation Europe, um, is going to present to us. So, over to him. Thank you very much for uh, being able to uh, for inviting me. Um, yeah, as I said, I'm Matthias Kushner. I work for Free Software Foundation Europe, and here on my hands, I have more computing power than the whole world together than we landed on the moon. So this is an extremely powerful machine, and we should not forget that these machines are so powerful. And um, at the time. At this time, people would not have imagined what we are able to do with computers nowadays. Computers today, they are not just in space shuttles, and you don't need a large room to uh, have a computer in there. Today, we have them in our pockets, we have them in our office desks, we have them um, on every desk in the, uh, on our laptops, we have them at home as a Wi-Fi router or as a television. And um, we have plenty of them in our cars or planes. And even some of us have them inside our bodies as a hearing aid or as a defibrillator directly attached to our heart. So there are all those different machines, uh, there, are, there are all those different things you can do with one single machine. And even if today we would sit together here and think about the craziest ideas we could do with those computers, we would only uh, come up with a fraction of what would be possible in the future. Because this machine is not limited by a few people what you can do with it, but it's just limited by the imagination of all the people around the world who have such a device. So, it's an extremely powerful machine which you can use for all kinds of different things. The question is, will that be so in future? Who will decide what we can do with this machine and what we are not allowed to do with this machine? Who will be the one who decides what we can do with our computers? Who will be able to decide who, who can control the, the computers uh, which might be dangerous to us. For example, will it look like that for a computer which controls the nuclear missiles? Or will it look like that? And will the president be able to tell another engineer to check if the button is really doing what he thinks the button is doing before he presses it? So. During the time, companies found out that they might have an interest to limit what we can do with this machine. That they have a financial benefit out of that. And so, slice by slice, they removed possibilities from us what we can do with this computer. They made it more from a general purpose device into special purpose devices. And often those slices, they are so thin we don't even realize that something is lost. So, in this talk I want to give you some examples of how this machine was restricted more and more. Then I want to share some ideas what we, what we can do to counter this. And afterwards I think, uh, I, I hope we can have a discussion here and also later at the conference what ideas you have to, to um, yeah preserve the computer as a general purpose machine. So, the first one is probably quite obvious for you. In the beginning, when you had a computer, you had a software with it, and you can do everything with that computer. With that software. Nobody was uh, telling you what you are allowed to do and what you are not allowed to do. Now, some people found, thought that they can make more money if they restrict us. So, they made the software proprietary. They told us who is allowed to use the software, so they excluded some people from using it. They told us what we are allowed to do with the software and restricted the use cases. 
they further made it very difficult for us to understand what the software is really doing, how these machines work. They didn't give us the source code anymore. And they also didn't allow us anymore to share the software as we wanted to. And so by that they disabled us from helping people to solve problems we already solved, or in general helping people to solve problems. And furthermore, they restricted how we are able to use those devices to fit our own needs, to change the behavior of the machines instead of changing our own behavior to fit what a machine tells us to do. So they did that with, um, with legal tools like software licenses and also with technical measures like not giving the source code and hiding it. Imagine how far we would have been already in our society if all software would have been free from the beginning and would have stayed free. So that's something we, we wouldn't have to rewrite all the things, we could just change some little things and can uh, spend our resources to fix new problems instead of reinventing the wheel every time and every time. So that was one of the larger things we challenged to, uh, to disable us to use this machine with the potential it could have. The other restrictions, restrictions this machine got are often uh, summarized under uh, the label digital restriction management. So the idea there is that um, a company invests resources to make the computer less powerful than it was before, to remove functionality, not to add a functionality which is good for the user. One of the, uh, one of the examples most people on the streets know is the SIM card lock. So, in general, when you have a mobile phone, you can put your SIM card in, in this mobile phone, you can also, when you go on vacation, you can add in another SIM card and it will work. But uh, they introduced uh, um, a feature that restricted which cards you can put in there and with which cards it will work. And by that, they made it first the computer less powerful than it would be. And nobody, if they, or at least I haven't met some until now, um, when they have uh, the possibility to choose between one device with SIM card lock and another without, they would always choose the one without SIM card lock. They would even go to a shop and pay money to get rid of it. it it's just one of those examples which people understand, oh, okay, that's, that's one of the restrictions and most people will also agree that it's not a good thing, especially when they are on vacation. It's uh, yeah, not very helpful. Another part where a lot of restrictions came to the computers was um, the DVD. So most of you probably don't know this because you use uh, software which ignores it. Or do, do you see such uh, notices when you watch DVD? No, no, no. Do you still watch DVD or? <laughs> so, yeah, most people who had a normal DVD player when they entered, uh, put the DVD in the slot, they saw something like this. And uh, they couldn't say fast forward this because the track was unskippable. And they have to read that all the time. Sometimes it's one track, sometimes it's two or three, and they tell you what you are not allowed to do. So, they tell you that you are not allowed to copy the DVD and they also tell you what will happen when you do so. And um, you have to watch this every time. So you cannot say, I've seen that the 15th time already, so please continue. But you have to watch it again and again. Now, with this, they added a restriction to the machine, which also had effects on other parts of this machine, that you cannot change other things. And, um, and all of that, because of what, what would have happened if we wouldn't have seen that? People wouldn't have seen that they are not allowed to copy a DVD and they wouldn't know what a sentence for this is. But um, some companies might have lost money. But what about other computers around us? What, how would something like this look like if we um, go in our car? I mean, if I go with a car, I can kill people if I don't use it properly. So, if I sit in my car, 
how would such uh, notices look like there? Would I have to sit there for 15 minutes, starting with, okay, please, drive on the right side. Um, you shouldn't <coughs> drive as fast uh, uh, in the city as you drive on a highway. Um, a red light doesn't mean drive as fast as you can, but it means stop, and all those uh, different things. So would we have to sit there every time before we want to go to the supermarket? Because that's really something which, uh, which could harm people if you don't know it. So that's one of the things where the relationship between interfering with the, with the technology and the benefit you get out of that is questionable. The other part they also did with QVDs was they divided the world into five regions. And uh, that was the, the region code. So you have a DVD and you can only play it with computers in this region, in the same region. So if you buy a DVD in the US, you can only play it with the players from the US. And in general, if they wouldn't have had this feature, you could have played it everywhere. You could have bought a DVD in vacation and could have watched it at home. It was not possible anymore. And with CDs, there was something similar. They, uh, they, one thing which the machine, this general purpose computer, is very, very good at is to copy files. So it's very, very easy to have one file and the next moment you have 10, 100, 1000. It's the best machine for this. Or you have almost no costs. And with the internet, you are able to move files from one part of the world to another part of the world in seconds. Now, you would imagine that the music industry would have thought, wow, we have such a powerful tool. We can distribute our music to the people without any costs for the shops, uh, for printing those uh, the, uh, CDs, uh, and so on. We can limit our costs. But that was not how they thought. Their idea was, how can we make this computer, how can we cut down this, this uh, functionality so that it doesn't copy our CDs? How can we take out one of its core functionalities? And that's when they uh, introduced the copy protection for music, music CDs. So they added this on the CD. The, um, the, uh, the, the um, situation at that time was that um, they did it in a very bad way. So a lot of uh, these CDs, they didn't work in like your car CD player or um, some other uh, device, some older CD players. The good thing at that time was that the, um, the music industry, they had to put a label on those uh, CDs. So it was written copyright, uh, copy protected CD. And then people could decide if they want to buy such a CD or not. So, it didn't stop there with CDs. Imagine you would go to a, a music store and you buy a CD. You go home, you put the CD into your computer, and then the computer installs a program without your knowledge, and this program checks what's going on in your computer. And if it um, realizes that there is a program starting which could copy the CD, it kills this process. Beside that, it's also slowing down your computer, and it is opening um, back doors for other people. And that's what you got when you uh, gave 20 euros to Sony. Sony did that with 50 million music CDs. They attacked the computers of their customers to make sure that they cannot copy it. So they limited functionality on this computer and destroyed functionality on our computers after we gave, it to, gave 20 euros to them. And it didn't stop with individual users, but this, was also, uh, this also affected 200,000 governmental and military computers. So because a company didn't want CDs to be copied, we had backdoors in 200,000 computers which could do harm to us if they are infected. Um, okay, this may, may sound a bit stupid. Who of you ever lent a book to someone else? Okay. And who of you already sent a file, uh, a computer file, to a friend by email? Okay. 
I don't think it's very difficult. But um, that's why I was puzzled when I read once that Amazon is now uh, providing um, um, it advertised a new functionality that you can rent ebooks. Um, so how can this happen? How can something which is so easy? I mean, we gave around books all the time, and we could send around data, and an ebook is just data on our computer. Why wasn't it possible from the beginning? It wasn't possible because they made this ebook readers. They invested a lot of efforts to make um, to forbid copying certain files on this computer. And by doing that, um, also they, they they try to make it uh, hard for you to install other programs, so you, you are not able to um, transfer files. And they just they, they controlled this device. They made sure that they control it and not the owner of this device. And now imagine that you go to a bookstore and you buy a book there. You go home, you read a few pages, you put it in your bookshelf and you go to sleep. And during the night, your uh, bookseller comes to your home, takes out a book and goes away with it. Sounds a bit unrealistic, but that's exactly what Amazon did with a lot of books on, the, um, on their um, customers' readers. They just removed it without their knowledge, without them being able to do anything about it. And as some of you might know, the uh, book uh, 1984 by George Orwell was amongst it. So they removed 1984 from all the devices from their customers. And that was only possible because it was not you anymore who had control over your computer, this ebook reader. It was them. They had control over your computer. They had control over your data on this computer. And that's something which you see more and more that it's not just with ebook readers, it's also with gaming consoles, with mobile phones, um, with all kinds of, of different devices that they don't just try to prevent it from like the CD uh, on this other medium, but they want control the whole stack on this computer to make sure that you do what they want to do. So, who of you heard about uh, UEFI? UEFI Secure Boot. Okay, and a trusted platform module also. Okay, so, um, in the old days it was quite difficult to install a Linux distribution on your computer. I mean, it, took quite some hours. I think I spent one day uh, to install my first Google Linux distribution. At the end of the day, I just had the command line and it took me several hours uh, till I had X working. And afterwards, I mean, no sound printer or whatever. So we improved and meanwhile, it's possible to install it in a few minutes, but that might change again. So the to go back to, to UEFI and uh, to UEFI Secure Boot and Trusted, uh, trusted Computing. The, the idea there is that you have a chain of trust. So in, in a nutshell, you have, uh, you have your hardware and the hardware only starts trusted operating systems. So you have a key and the operating system is signed with this key. I mean, there's between, there are other layers, bootloader and so on. But, uh, this operating system, which is signed with the key, then starts, and afterwards um, the operating system can decide which applications it is uh, it's allowing to start and what those applications can do with your data. I mean, we had it in the talk this morning how this is useful to, to have such kind of uh, restrictions, how uh, applications can access our data and so on. So what, what we can do with this is we can decide in the beginning, I trust this new Linux distribution and their key. And then just this operating system will start and not another one which is was manipulated. And afterwards this operating system will uh, be able to protect me against others installing malicious programs. Like they could protect me against the Sony rootkit. And um, afterwards this operating system will um, these, these programs, I can give them certain rights or uh, certain permissions. 
So for example, um, I could have an Amazon application on my computer and I can allow this application to download ebooks. I can also read my ebooks, but I might not allow this program to delete my um, files without my knowledge. So that's a very good, uh, very good thing you can do with this technology. And it's especially relevant if the owner of um, the computer is not the user. Like, um, imagine you would have to write the software for this, uh, for this machine here. What do you think the bank wants? Do you think the bank wants that the user of this machine can change the software on those devices and manipulate the data? I don't think so. I think they want that only trusted people are able to modify this. And the user is just able to go there, enter the PIN, say I want to see how much money I have and I want as much money as possible out of this machine. That's what they want. And that's the same case like with at a supermarket. Yeah, you don't want uh, your employees to uh, manipulate this and afterwards getting some money for their own when people buy something there or for when, when you buy a ticket um, at a um, at your train station, you don't want the user to control this, but you want the owner to protect against people who, who um, use this computer. Now, the, um, the problem is that the same system I just explained can be used against the owner. So, it will, can switch from protecting the owner of a computer to attacking it. And the only thing you have to do is, you have to switch the root of it. So, the only thing you do is, you do not allow the owner of the computer to decide which of those keys you trust. Which software at the beginning you trust and which you don't trust. And if you change this, then the whole system will flip. If you do not decide which keys you trust, someone else will decide which operating systems you will be able to start on this hardware. And someone else will decide which applications will run on your computer and which not. And someone else will decide what will happen with your data. So you, as the owner of this computer, will not be in control of that anymore. It will be someone else who will decide what you can do with that. And that's, at the moment, exactly the problem in which direction we are going. With, um, it's, like I said before, it's small slices. And often it's still that these specifications, they are written in a way that they would allow it to be the way that you, as the owner, are the one who controls this machine. But they don't guarantee it anymore. In previous versions, for example, with the Trusted Platform module, it was guaranteed that the owner of the device has the full control of it. There were things like the physical access to the, to the computer. You had to prove that you are here at this computer to change certain things. But now it's switching more and more in the other direction. And they distribute this to, like, they have the Trusted Platform module, they have UEFI Secure Boot. They can work quite nicely together, but it's not too obvious. Um, and uh, then you have the Microsoft Logo Hick um, hardware requirements, which uh, um, are not uh, part of the specification, but they influence the market. And so step by step, it's going into a direction where we don't control that anymore. So the question is, how do we deal with that? How do, you, do we deal with a situation that we as the owners of those devices are not in control of them anymore, or might not be in control of them anymore? For me, it's the first thing we have to resist. And that might sound obvious, but I think the, the main important thing, the most important thing is that we don't accept this. We should not accept that this is normal, that someone else is being able to limit what we can do with these machines. It is not right that someone else decides what we are allowed to do and what we are not allowed to do on a technical level. The laws are, it's okay when laws respect what we are doing, but not some engineer should decide what we are able to do and what we are not allowed to do with these powerful machines. So, the first thing, don't accept it. If you, even if you do nothing else about it, don't accept it. This is normal. But 
I think you want to do more, and um, all of you already do, because one important part in uh, in this topic is that we need to continue to write good free software. We need to help others to learn how free software works, how to program. In your community, you help new people to understand how it works, how to get active, how to write uh, free software, how to um, explain people how to use free software, and uh, you share it with others. So that's a very important thing. You are part of a very important uh, movement who is uh, enabling people to control their own technology. The software is the heart of all these machines, so we should be able to, ena uh, to enable people, to empower people to use them as they want to use them. And, yeah, but <coughs> on a more concrete side, for this topic, there are other things which, which are um, important to do. One of them is, you can help that we preserve the right to tinker. So that um, there are no laws which prevent us from modifying software on our own computers. We should always be allowed legally to install another software on this computer without uh, breaking any laws. And we should always be allowed to change and modify hardware if we want. The other part is about labels. You can help us to make sure that devices which restrict us and which include a lot of those restrictions that they are labeled like with the CDs that people can decide if they really want to buy a device which is limiting and restricting what we are able to do and the other part is help us to help us that we have good specifications that those specifications guarantee the owner of a computer that she has the full control over this computer. It, uh, it shouldn't be the case that someone else has the, the right to do that, to control what you are able to do. So the specification should be clear that you are the one who is in charge of your computer. So those are very high level things to do. And it's uh, probably difficult to convince your parents to participate in this. It's also probably difficult to convince them to program uh, with you and improve, uh, improve the software on a coding basis. So one, one crucial point um, we need to preserve this general purpose computer is we, we have to think about ways for people to participate in this movement without a lot of effort without uh, people who don't have a lot of time, who don't have uh, technical skills. And so, because all, all those people who do small little things, we, will, we can change it and we can make sure that this computer is still preserved as this machine, which could be so powerful. And now I just want to share uh, uh, some random ideas, what people told me, yeah, I do this, or what I did in the past, um, and afterwards I would like to discuss with you what your ideas are, and um, what we could do. Um, one, of the, one of the first things, which is quite easy, I mean, most people, they go shopping. And um, in the free software community, we are often too smart. So we know before which computers run for software and which not. And so we don't go to the shops and ask if they have it or not. We already know before this shop has it, this shop doesn't. Um, so people in those shops, they don't hear about the demands people have who value software freedom. They don't hear that because we already do our research at home. Other people, they go to shops and ask for what they would like to buy and they say, no, no, we don't have that, but when a lot of people come and ask for it, they might have it in stock afterwards. So, one of the things, for example, I did in the past was, whenever I was uh, shopping and I had three minutes to spare, I asked them, do you have any computers with pre-installed Linux? Several years ago, most people looked puzzled at me. Um, what's that? And um, 
depending on my time, I explained it to them, or yeah, I just walked away. And the um, so, but it changed over time. And uh, after some time, when you ask them, "Hey, do you have it?" They say, "No, unfortunately, no." And then you only oh, met a sad face, and you walked away. And they, ah, oh, damn, we couldn't fulfill the wishes of our customer. And um, yeah, so so that was something. It's a very small thing to do, three minutes. And um, I could also explain it to my parents when they go there. You can also ask, and uh, when they say no, which is unfortunately often the case, they can just walk away. And you can do that for other devices as well, not just for, for your laptop. You can do that for um, some media players, for your television. Um, even if you buy a car, I mean, ask some questions. Uh, am I allowed to modify the software there? Um, am I allowed to do that? So you get other people thinking about restrictions those uh, machines have. So that's a very small thing. Um, the other part is, um, when we raise more, when, when we demand things and people offer it to us, we should pay for it <laughs> and we should support those companies who give us something uh, which values us. So when we have the possibility to buy a computer with pre-installed Linux and it costs a little bit more than the same model without, I think we should support the companies who value our freedom and give as less, as less money as possible to the companies who don't care about what we can do with those computers. So if we have the possibility to give money to the good guys, let's give it to the good companies. And that's also something which you can very easily explain to friends around you. Instead of, uh, okay, I'm now sitting down with you, you bought this laptop, okay, now I sit down uh, one hour and help you to install it. No, tell them there are some offers, buy something pre-installed. Or I will help you this time, but next time, please buy something pre-installed. Same for, for these other devices. And it's, I mean, sometimes it, it's even good if you, like, if you help someone, that you help people to understand that, that they should support people with money who do good things. So when you help them to install it, like a few um, years ago, I got a phone call in, in, in the office. Someone asked me, yeah, what's your bank account number? And I thought, why do you want to know? I mean, I, I'll give it to you, but why do you want to know? And so uh, a friend helped him to install the Linux on the laptop. And the friend said, okay, but if I help you, please support one of the uh, uh, organizations with a donation. And that's something which is going in the right direction. You offer a service to help people to support what we're doing. Now, the other one is, uh, don't take that too serious. But um, a friend of mine, he was working in a, in a software company, as a programmer, and at one time, the company, they changed their policy. And they forced him to write non-free software. And he was very angry about that. Uh, as he, he's a clever guy and he doesn't want to support non-free software development. But uh, he had lots of arguments with the company and still they didn't change anything. So, till he found a new job, he uh, one time explained to me, yeah, uh, till, till they do it, to do that, I, uh, I spend 10 minutes more in the bathroom during office hours. And uh, so that's 10 minutes a day, that's 50 uh, minutes during the week, and that costs the um, uh, company that much money. So, I mean, I don't say that that's the best solution, but it's still one small thing which people might help to live with this tech better, and it's one very small thing. In the end, I'm quite glad that uh, he found another job and is now supporting a free software company and providing free software again. So, Good. The, the other part. Um, politicians are contacted by a lot of people about all kinds of strange things. So don't be shy to talk with them about software freedom. Don't be shy to talk with them about restrictions on technology. They have to deal with much stranger things during their day. And it's also when when someone goes there, when, when you go to them and talk with them about it, you don't have to be the one who convinces the politicians to start a huge migration. That, that you don't need to be that person. 
it's totally fine if you go there and you explain free software and that politician afterwards, when something will change, some laws are introduced, some things are to, to vote on, that the person remembers, oh, there were some people in the past who talked with me about free software, that's something good, I don't understand it completely, but yeah, I vote yes. So, it's something which takes 10 minutes or so to go to uh, um, a politician, talk a little bit with him about it, and um, yeah, you can also ask your friends to also do that. It's, it's not that much of an effort. The, the other part uh, I think it's very important is that we spread information about free software, spread information about restrictions in devices, and um, like on this URL you can uh, order free information material from the FSFE, but there are lots of organizations out there who have information material, and uh, often when you go to your library and you ask them, can I put this on the table here, they will say yes, no problem, they often uh, react like, oh yeah, that's nice, that's uh, uh, you, how you can encrypt emails, oh, that's a lot of people would be interested in that, and um, also when you go to your cafe, put some uh, leaflets there, so it, it's something, it's a very small thing to do when you go to the library, you put some stickers there, you put some leaflets there, and more people will know about it. The one small thing which lots of us, I think, uh, might underestimate is show that you are part of this group who values software freedom and who values that you can control your, your um, devices. So, like, put some logos somewhere. Um, when I was in Berlin one time, I wanted to uh, um, push the button at a traffic light and uh, the button was uh, a GNOME logo. So, uh, I mean, that made my day. <laughs> so, it's really cool to, to go there and, oh, wow, cool, there are others out there who, who support that. Or I walk out of my house and just 200 meters away, there's a guy walking with an FSFE t-shirt and I don't know this guy. Um, but yeah, um, it's someone else who was also with me on, the, on this, in the same movement. And that's something like, yeah, you can have a piercing, <laughs> um, or the, it, it's small signs you can, you can put somewhere. Even if you are in a company which does non-free software, um, you might say, oh, there's someone else who also is uh, thinking the same things, has the same values. Uh, you can put some poses on your wall. Show that you are part of this. And the, the last thing I want to share with you is, in the, in the free software community, we are often too critical with each other and we, there are heated discussions and we write bug reports, feature requests and oh you should do this a different way and one small thing everybody of us can do and all people around you can do is to thank others <coughs> if they are doing this work. To say thank you once, even if it's once a year, it's five minutes by email, Invite a friend who is developing free software, buy them something to drink. And one of the reminders we have for that in FSFE is on the 14th of February, we said that's the I Love Free Software Day, so we want to remind you about that. Very small thing to do to preserve our computer the way it is, motivate people who give you freedom for those devices. So, to go back to the question, of the uh, controllability. Today, many people around the world still don't profit from fundamental freedoms like freedom of, the sp freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of association, privacy, or other freedoms some of us take as granted. They have to fight for them every day. And once you have them, it doesn't stop there. As a society, we constantly have to, fend, to defend them. And sometimes, we also have to add new freedoms to this set in order to better protect the others. And as today, there are so many computers around us, and it's, uh, computers have such an important role, we also have to fight for, and we have to constantly defend software freedom, the right to control our technology. So, thank you very much. Thank you for listening. And uh, thank you for developing this software.
the only thing the only thing that you're saying when you enable secure code is I trust the firmware maker and the hardware maker more than I do random people on the internet. No, no it's it's what what the problem at the moment the problem with secure boot is for example how it is implemented today. So first of all the implementation itself is very very neutral. You can implement it in any way. That's why the specification on itself is yeah, it's it's there, you can implement it in a good way or you can implement it in a bad way. So the thing is that it's connected with other things. It's connected with the Microsoft hardware requirements. And at the beginning, they said you have to disable, uh, have to be able to disable them on uh, PCs. But they said you are not allowed to disable them on our, on our architecture. Yeah. So the thing afterwards that, that is product doesn't exist anymore. Now they even said that they might. So I mean, we, we can also, if you want, we can discuss it afterwards. I can show you the comments by the German government, by the Chinese government, who at the moment oppose a lot of the uh, things how T trusted platform module want to one dot two to two dot zero was changed from um, the necessity for the owner to control this device to someone else being able to control it. The government have real concerns that uh, someone else will control their infrastructure. And with Secure Boot, it is the same when hardware manufacturers implement it in a way which uh, they can implement it in a way which will not allow you anymore to control that what you will be able to start on this computer and what not. They can do that in that way. And I think the specifications have to make sure that the owner always has the full control. I, I completely agree, but I think that the functionality that he enables is also very important. Let, let's discuss that. I think we can. <laughs> Any other questions? We've got a few more minutes. I think. Any other questions? Okay, then. Thank you very much.